Olha lá, está no ar o TV Com Doc, espaço para exibição de documentários da TV Com e entidades parceiras. O TV Com Doc é exibido aqui no canal comunitário todos os sábados e domingos. O documentário que nós vamos exibir hoje, O Filho do General, é baseado nos depoimentos de Mirko Paled, filho de um famoso general israelense. Seus depoimentos nesse documentário mostram os crimes, assassinatos e genocídio promovido pelo Estado terrorista de Israel contra o povo palestino. Com vocês, O Filho do General. Miko Pellet is a peace activist who dares to say in public what others still choose to deny. Born in Jerusalem in 1961 into a well-known Zionist family, his father, Matty Pellet, was a young officer in the War of 1948 and a general in the War of 1967, when Israel conquered the West Bank, Gaza, Golan Heights, and Sinai. Miko's unlikely opinions reflect his father's legacy. General Pellet was a war hero turned peacemaker. It's time to sweep away some of the myths and to uncover the truth so that we can finally live in peace together. And so the three myths that I like to uncover, the three probably most popular myths, the most common myths, the myth of 1948, The, where, well, the myth was that there was a, a, a country without a people. And then the myth of the existential threat of 1967. And then finally, the myth of the Israeli democracy. Growing up, we were taught to believe that the Arabs had left Eretz Israel, partly on their own and partly at the directive of their so-called leaders, and that therefore taking their land and taking their homes was morally okay. It never occurred to us that even if they did leave willingly, we had no right to prohibit their return. But then, Israeli historians had found that just as Palestinians have been saying for decades, none of this was true. And it's interesting that when Palestinians claim something, <clears throat> we tend to doubt it. But then when Israeli historians come up and say the exact same thing, well then, now we accept it as though the Palestinian word is not, is not good enough. And so Israeli historians had confirmed that Israel was created on the ruins of Palestine. Now, obviously Palestine was not a state yet at the time, we're talking about 1948, but um, it, was, it would have been a state very shortly thereafter had it not been so completely destroyed. That had bustling cities, It had a middle class, it had trade and commerce, Palestinians had judges and scholars and they had a rich political life, um, and um, they had all the, all, the, all the characteristics of a state to be. But the one thing in which they didn't invest, the one thing in which Palestinians did not have, was the military, any kind of militia. And so when the Jewish militias attacked, even though the Palestinians constituted the vast majority of the population, when the Jewish militias attacked, they were helpless. The, Jewish, the Jews, on the other hand, in Palestine at the time, were a minority, probably less than half a million, but they had put together uh, state-like institutions. So they had their own schools, they had their own universal health care system, for example. They had a quasi-government, of which my grandfather was a member. And all of these were created based on the principle of hafrada, which in Hebrew means segregation. In other words, to be completely separate from all the institutions that the Palestinians had had. And the one thing that they did, in which they did invest heavily was a very strong militia. A militia of young men, well indoctrinated, well-trained, of which my father was a member, and they were determined to create a Jewish state in Palestine, completely disregarding the fact that the majority of the population were not 
Jews, but were Palestinian Arabs. It turns out that the creation of Israel had not, after all, been a haphazard fight in which the Arabs fled their homes due to the directives of their own leaders. It had been an unprovoked, systematic campaign of ethnic cleansing by the Jewish militia involving massacres, terrorism, and the wholesale looting of an entire nation. Now it's interesting, my mother was born and raised in Jerusalem. She was born in 1926. And she recalls the Palestinian neighborhoods in West Jerusalem. And when the residents of these neighborhoods were forced to leave, their homes, which are still in Jerusalem, their beautiful, spacious homes with beautiful gardens, uh, were offered to Jewish families. And one such home was offered to her, being the wife of, a, of an officer and so forth. And she refused it. She said she could not bring herself to move into the home of a family that had been forced out and is now living in a refugee camp. She also said, and I heard this confirmed by many people, that when the Jewish forces came into the homes, the coffee was still warm on the table. The people had just left. And then the looting began. And again, she recalls seeing the truckloads of furniture and rugs and what have you being taken away from those homes. Another widely accepted Zionist myth is that in 1967, Israel faced an existential threat where um, the armies of three Arab countries were invading and miraculously the Jewish forces were able to beat them all and conquer huge, huge, huge tracts of land. Now, setting aside for a moment the fact that endless, countless books have been written in Hebrew and English and Arabic and other languages and that um, documentaries have been filmed disproving this completely and showing that the purpose of the war was conquest. In my own research, in my own research in pre preparation for this book, I went, I spent days at the Israeli army archives and I read from the minutes of the meetings of the Israeli general staff, the top IDF, top brass, and the things that were said uh, during those meetings. And I want again, I want to quote from my book um, one such passage. In a stormy meeting of the IDF top brass in the Israeli cabinet that took place on the 2nd of June, 1967, my father, General Mati Pele, told the cabinet in no uncertain terms that the Egyptians needed at least a year and a half in order to be prepared for a full-scale war. His point was that the time to strike a devastating blow against the Egyptian army was now not because of an existential threat, but because the Egyptian army was not prepared and it was an opportunity to destroy it once again. The other generals agreed, but the cabinet was hes hesitant. The prime minister was not sure a full-scale war was the right thing to do, and a tug of war of unimaginable proportions ensued. During that same stormy meeting, my father said to the Prime Minister, President Nasser, referring to Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser, President Nasser is advancing an ill-prepared army because he's counting on the cabinet being hesitant. He's convinced that we will not strike your hesitation is working to his advantage. Later on, he accused the Prime Minister of insulting the army, this army that had never lost in battle, by not allowing the army to attack right now. So there was never any mention of an existential threat, just an opportunity to once again assert Israeli strength. In the end, the cabinet succumbed to the enormous pressure placed upon them by the general, and they, um, and they decided on a preemptive strike that began on, the June, on June the 5th, 1967. And again, I want to quote from my book. The surprise attack led to the total destruction of, the, of Egypt's air force, the decimation of the Egyptian army, and the reconquest of the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula in a matter of days. The Israeli army also knew that the Syrian army was in shambles and the Jordanians were no match for the IDF strength. After the campaign of Egypt went so smoothly, the generals turned their attention to the West Bank and the Golan Heights, two regions that Israel had coveted for many years. 
Both regions had strategic water resources and hills overlooking Israeli territory. And the West Bank contained the heartland of, Israel, of biblical Israel and the crown jewel, the old city of Jerusalem. In six days, it was all over. Arab casualties were estimated at 15,000. That's 15,000 dead in six days. Israeli casualties were 700. And the territory controlled by Israel had nearly tripled in size. Israel had in its possession not only the land and resources it had wanted for a long time, but also the largest stockpiles of Russian-made arms outside of Russia. Israel had once again asserted itself as a major regional power or as the neighborhood bully. Now here's something of immense proportion that takes place and take into account that this is over four decades ago. And again I quote, At the first weekly meeting of the general staff after the Six-Day War, Chief of Staff Yitzhak Rabin was beaming with the glory of victory. But when the meeting was nearing its end, my father raised his hand. When he was called on, he spoke of the unique chance the victory offered to solve the Palestinian problem once and for all. For the first time, he said, in Israel's history, we were face to face with the Palestinians without any other Arab countries between us. Now we had a chance to offer them a state in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. He claimed with certainty that holding on to the West Bank and people who lived in it was contrary to Israel's long-term strategy. Popular resistance to the occupation was sure to rise and Israel, Israel's army would be used to quell that resistance with disastrous and demoralizing results. It would turn the Jewish state into an increasingly brutal occupying power and eventually into a binational state. And this is precisely the reality in which we live today, nearly four and a half decades after that. So does anyone seriously, can, can we really expect that five million Palestinians will keep living under a regime that is democratic to Jews, but is brutally oppressive towards Palestinians? With about six million Jews and about five or five and a half million Palestinians living in, under the same rule, under the same government, but with different laws. My father, who was a military expert, had spent the remainder of his life after he retired from the military fighting for justice for the Palestinian cause. And being a former military man, he was often asked about Palestinian terrorism. Um, on one such occasion, when he was being interviewed by the Israeli television, he said this about terrorism. He said, terrorism is a terrible thing, but the fact remains that when a small nation is governed by a larger power, terrorism is the only means at their disposal. My father's predictions have all come true. Now the work of the Israeli lobby in the United States notwithstanding, more and more people around the world are beginning to realize that there are in fact two nations who live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean and that the conditions under which Palestinians live are completely unacceptable. Uh, recently we had an event here in San Diego which was a vigil to, to, remember, the na to remember those who were killed in Gaza by the Israeli army. And as this vigil was taking place, there was a large contingent of Israeli supporters. We were separated from them by a line of police and what I think is a sense of morality. And they were dancing and singing as those of us that were at the vigil commemorated tried to, or tried to recall the names of 1,400 people that were killed. These were three weeks of such death and destruction that one can hardly comprehend. And I remember the stories of the Israeli Air, Air Force pilots who flew sortie after sortie, dumping hundreds of tons of bombs on a civilian population in Gaza, and would then return home to celebrate the festival of Hanukkah. See, because the attacks in Gaza at the end of 2007 took place during the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. Then, these same pilots, having celebrated with their families, slept in the comfort of their beds, got up the next day, and did it again and again and again. I recall that while we were at the vigil, these are the supporters of Israel held signs that said, 
But the Israeli army had warned them. The Israeli army had dropped thousands of leaflets warning the Palestinians that this horror was about to, to begin. And I can only imagine the mother seeing these warnings, knowing that this horror was impending, but also knowing that there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to save her children from the bombs and from the fire, from the smoke and from the chemicals, and from the phosphorus that consumes the flesh and won't be extinguished. Because Gaza is locked down. Gaza is under siege, a siege that was imposed by Israel on the people of Gaza. So for these young Israeli pilots, these young men who most Israelis and, and Israeli supporters around the world consider their finest, this was really nothing but shooting fish in a barrel as they began their merciless onslaught at exactly 11.25 in the morning on December the 27th, 2008. And that date, December 27, 2008, will forever be etched in our memories as the darkest and most shameful day in the long history of the Jewish people. As Israel began a shameful and merciless attack on the people of Gaza. The attacks began at 11.25 in the morning, the precise time that the children of Gaza are on the streets. Between 11 and 11.30, children of Gaza are either on the way to school or on the way home from school, as that is the time that the two shifts of the school day change. Now, the, the, the Israeli supporters who come to the vigils, who always maintain that they support Israeli brutality, their claim is that Israel had the right to defend itself, but Israel's actions were, were justified because Israel was defending itself against the onslaught of rockets that were being shot into Israel by Hamas militants out of Gaza. Thousands and thousands of rockets that were designed to harm Israeli citizens. Now I know a thing or two about these rockets. I recall sitting on a Saturday afternoon with my family and my children in a kibbutz not far from Gaza. And at one point, we heard those rockets flying overhead. And we heard the sirens and the, the warning signs. And we all had to run into the protective rooms that were built for that. And it was frightening. Only last December, I visited the kibbutz again, and a Qassam rocket fell by the kindergarten on the kibbutz, while the children were present and were outside. There was shattered glass everywhere. Children were hurt. They were bleeding. Some of the children had to be hospitalized. Some of the children were in shock. It was horrible. I went and I walked and I saw the hole in the ground created by the rocket, the size of a large soccer ball. And then I remembered what a crater that is, that is created by a one-ton bomb looks like. It's the size of a city block. Children aren't scratched and they're not in shock as a result of that. They're decimated. They are burnt. They choke, under the, they choke from the fumes and they are buried in the rubble. Now, multiply that by a hundred and then again and then again and remember, or keep in mind, that Gaza is one of the most highly, most densely populated areas in the world. Yet, Israeli supporters will justify this. Many Jewish people will recall the story in the book of Genesis, chapter 18, where God decides to destroy the city of Sodom because they were sinners. And the patriarch Abraham, the, patriarch Abraham, the shared patriarch of Jews and Arabs, chastises God and says to him, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Perhaps there be fifty righteous in the city. You see, Abraham is chastising God. And God promises that if he finds fifty righteous people, he will spare the city. Well, in Israel there is no Abraham today. And no Palestinians are righteous in the eyes of the Israelis. 
And as we know, the 800,000 children of Gaza were not spared this horror. You know, I'm often accused of being one-sided and of not mentioning Palestinian terrorism and the suffering that Israelis have to go through. So I'm going to touch on that right now. Um, as my father said decades ago, when a larger power rules a smaller nation, some form of violent resistance is to be expected. And as for my own family's brush with terrorism, in our case it drove all of us to engage with the Palestinians and to reach out. And the same thing happened to me personally. And again, I want to quote a passage from my book, The General's Son. Then, in the fall of 1997, disaster. My niece Madar was killed by Palestinian suicide bombers in Jerusalem. Several hours later, there we were, driving along the road to the cemetery. Police escorted our procession on motorcycles, making way for vans carrying the devastated family members of another Jewish casualty. As we got out of the van, someone approached and asked me to carry the small coffin. My heart felt far heavier than the heartbreakingly slight weight on my shoulders. Israelis and Palestinians, family members and friends, famous leaders and ordinary people, all came to give eulogies and to express their sorrow at this unspeakable loss. Smadar, my niece, was laid to rest near my father, her grandfather, in a small hilltop cemetery just outside Jerusalem. To this day, my sister Nareed cannot forgive herself for leaving her baby girl out alone in the cold, damp ground. But when my sister did come out to greet the mourners, the thousands who came to mourn, she did not ask for retaliation. She did not talk about revenge. The first words that came out of her mouth were these. No real mother would want the same horror to happen to another mother. And I, go, I quote again from the book. I stayed in Jerusalem for the week of the Shiva, the seven days of mourning. It wasn't easy to return home and, return, and resume my routines after it was over. How do people do this, I kept thinking to myself. How do people keep on living as though nothing had happened? How many songs have been sung, poems, poems read, and stories written about this feeling, the feeling one has when the unthinkable happens, yet the world doesn't end? It seemed pos impossible to carry on, but my mother always says that life was stronger than death, and so we went on. But something had changed. I knew I had to do something, and I knew that the right thing to do was to meet with Palestinians. And I did this right here in San Diego, and I was welcomed by the warm embrace of the local Palestinian community. The experience of meeting with Palestinians was comforting, it was liberating, and it was also heart-wrenchingly difficult. It was comforting to know that we're all very similar. And it was liberating to know that we don't have to be enemies. But it was heart-wrenchingly difficult to realize that I did not possess, I did not have full possession of the truth. And that is where I think Israeli supporters, mostly Jews, are, that's I think where most of them are. And I think it's time for Israeli, Israeli Jews and American Jews to join what was very eloquently described by Clovis Maksud as the constituency of conscience. You know, one can, only, one can only imagine what white South Africans went through when they saw that apartheid was coming to an end. Clearly they wanted to hold on to their way of life corrupt as, corrupt as it may have been. The whites in the southern states were probably trying to hold on as much as they could when they saw the end of legalized segregation and discrimination and racism come to an end in this country. We see this with leaders in the Middle East right now, holding on to the last minute, not wanting to give up their way of life and their control. And Zionists in Israel around the world are now doing the same, trying to hold on. We see brutal tyrants everywhere these days, from Libya to the Gulf states, do the same thing, holding on even as they fall one by one. Now Zionists and their supporters do the same, holding on to the notion that a racist regime can last, that injustice and horror can last, and that crimes against others who are different can go unpunished. But 
we are near the end. The Zionist dream of an ethnically homogenous state was shattered by the Zionists themselves with their insatiable hunger for land. In their own hands, they created a binational state where almost half of the population are not Jewish or Israeli, but are Palestinian Arabs. True that they have no rights. It's true that they're not counted. But this will come to an end sooner than most people think. I think it's safe to say that the non-violent resistance movement in Palestine will prevail. We have Israelis and Palestinians hand in hand, marching every single week in Bil'in, in Ne'elin, in Nabi Saleh, in Bet Umar, in Masara, in Sheikh Jirach, in Silwan, and in other places. They face the brutal force of the Israeli army every single week, but they are dedicated and they will prevail. And the dedication of these people is the reason that people like myself, who believe in justice and democracy, are optimistic. In Nabi Saleh, another beautiful spot in the West Bank where settlers have made their ugly mark, Israeli reservists, clumsy and armed to the teeth, are, are faced with the undaunted courage of mothers and their children who just want the settlers and the army out of their villages and out of their lives. It seems surprising that Israeli soldiers, young men and women, who are raised on what is seemingly a democrat in a democratic society are willing to enforce this brutal occupation because they do it very willingly and they do it very brutally but what we need to realize is that the Zionist education system taught these young men and women that Palestinian life is worthless so for those people who do want to associate themselves with Israel and with Zionism and drape, them, and drape themselves in the Zionist flag, the flag that has come to symbolize intolerance, hate, racism and brutality, they can feel free to do so. But they need to know this, that when the trials begin and the tribunals take their place and when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission begins its work and they're finally shamed into admitting that they were wrong, they need to remember to go down on their knees and beg forgiveness from the people they so blatantly wrong. Because they need to realize that we will never forget them and that their conscience will never allow them to forget that they supported the killing, they draped themselves in the flag, and they mocked the bereaved. The rest of us will move on and along with the rest of the Middle East, we will follow the example of the people of Egypt to create something that will surely be a tremendous accomplishment, a democratic, secular state in our shared homeland, a state where Muslims, Christians, and Jews live as equals and educate their children to love their diverse homeland with its multitude of, of cultures, its rich history, and its promising future.